So what I want to do is uh, uh, get into our study. We're in Joshua chapter 1 this morning, and we have come to the end of our study. I wanted to get Israel into the promised land. Joshua 1, Israel's ready to go into the promised land. But I think it's wise to start with a little bit of review. Because if you look behind, from, from, from Joshua 1, if we look behind us, we have covered a lot of ground. It all kind of started when we began Exodus 1, and we saw the horrific uh, circumstances Israel faced when they were enslaved by the Egyptians. And, and one of the things I think it's important to remember is, number one, that enslavement was a part of God's plan from the beginning, all the way back in Genesis 15, just a few chapters after God had called Abraham. He told Abraham about that enslavement. So it was a part of God's plan. It didn't take God by surprise. He was well aware of everything Israel was facing within that enslavement and in the appropriate time as far as his timing is concerned. He took steps to address Israel's need. And that basically started when he raised up Moses. And, and the story of Moses is really cool because if you remember, the first 40 years of his life, not only did he spend in Egypt so that he'd be very familiar with Egyptian culture, he was being raised in Pharaoh's household. The very people that he would have to negotiate with and interact with when it came time for him to fulfill the mission God had for him. If you look at the second 40 years of his life, they were spent in the very wilderness where he was going to spend 40 years leading God's people. So he was uniquely prepared for his role, and God used him as his leader to liberate his people from Egypt. We looked at the 10 uh, plagues that God rained down that kind of convinced the Egyptians that, you know, it's a really good idea. We're going to let you go. And God immediately led Israel out into the wilderness. And despite the hardship and the dangers and the difficulty they faced in the wilderness, what we saw was God's protection and God's provision all along the way didn't take them very long. They journeyed uh, to Mount Sinai, and they had an extended camp at Sinai because there God gave them the law, which literally would be the foundation for this new nation that God was building. I think it was two weeks ago. We saw how they packed up from Sinai. They made their way to the border, and and it was God's intention to lead them into the promised land, to take possession of the land that he had promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And if you were with us that particular Sunday, we saw how when they had the chance to, to gain the promised land, they allowed fear to make their decisions, and instead of obeying, they refused to go in. And that gave us an opportunity to get a sense of God's justice. Because the consequence of that rebellion was for each day the spies had been in the land. Forty days in the land, spying out the land so that they could make a plan to invade. For each day, Israel would wander in the wilderness. One day... For one year or, or they got a year for every day they were in the land you know what I'm talking about the next 40 years they would spend in the wilderness two people in that entire nation think about a nation that's a million and a half to two million people two people over the age of 20 would actually go in the promised land that 40 years was 40 years of death, waiting for that disbelieving, rebellious generation to die off. And as we come to Joshua 1, those 40 years are now over. This is a new day. 
This is a completely different group of people, and they are poised on the border of the promised land, and we end our study with a demonstration of God's grace. And here's why I think it's important, and it's why I think um, this is a great point, our, our point in our study to end. Most of us, when we look behind us, can find seasons where we made bad decisions, seasons where we acted poorly, seasons when we failed, seasons when we were discouraged, seasons where um, uh, we were disillusioned, seasons that were painful. Most of us probably all of us can look behind ourselves and see that over and over again. And, and the story of Israel was that story. There was pain, there was hardship, there was failure, there was rebellion. All of those things characterized Israel. And yet today, what we see is God keeping His promise and literally giving Israel another opportunity to gain the promised land. The question is, did they deserve that? And the answer is no. But that's what grace is. And we ought to be reminded of that often. There, there's, there's a certain amount of merit-based reward in all of us. And, and I think there's a time and a place for merit-based rewards. Grace is not merit-based. God doesn't give us grace because we've earned it, that we're worthy of it, that somehow we deserve it. He gives it to us because it is his nature. And so we look at Israel, and man, they did not deserve this second chance. But God gave them that second chance nonetheless. And guess what? God's nature has not changed. He's as gracious today as he has ever been. And if he was gracious to Israel, he'll be gracious for us. But here's what we need to understand. I don't care if it's a second chance, third chance, fourth chance, or umpteen chance. To capitalize on that next chance, we probably need to change. We can't keep making the same mistakes. We can't keep making the, the same old choices. We can't keep doing the same old stuff and expect this time it's going to be different. If Israel's going to capitalize on God's graciousness and God giving them a second chance, they're going to have to make some changes. And that's the story of Joshua 1. So as we come to Scripture this morning... I would suggest to you that the first change that Israel must make is they must now live a God-centered life. Let me read uh, the verses we're going to try to cover this morning. Joshua 1, verses 1 to 9. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan and go into the land that I'm about to give them to the Israelites. I'll give you every place where you set your foot, just as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, from the great river, uh, the river Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Be strong and courageous. Because you will lead these people to inherit the land that I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep the book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night. So you may be careful to do everything written in it. 
because then you will be prosperous and successful. Have not I commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God is you wherever you go. If you put yourself in Joshua's shoes, Moses has died. The baton has been passed to Joshua. He's about to lead Israel into the promised land, and, and it's like deja vu all over again. And, and our premise is, okay, God's given them a second chance. If they, if they take the second chance and do what they did last time, what's going to happen? It's going to be failure. They have to be different. And basically what God is doing here is outlining or or giving Joshua a formula. Hey Joshua, if you want to be successful, if you want to lead this nation so that they become the great nation God intends them to be, here is what you have to do. And he lays out a formula for, for, for Joshua to follow. And the formula is a God, a description of a God-centered life. And I would suggest to you that a God-centered life starts in our heart. And I would like to, to show, here's, here's how God describes that kind of heart for Joshua. He says, Joshua, I want you to be strong. Joshua, I want you to be courageous. Joshua, I don't want you to be terrified. And Joshua, I don't want you to be discouraged. Now, now, here's why God's saying all that. Go back with me 40 years earlier when Israel first came to the border of the promised land. God had brought them to the border so that they could invade, so that they could possess what God had already promised them. What God said, I am going to go with you. I am going to give you this land. Well, they had to make a choice. They had to either by faith, and if you remember when we were in that section of Scripture, they had all of the good news and all of the bad news to, to process in making the choice. It was everything God had promised, but there were giants and, and, and walled cities and, and well-equipped armies, and, and, and they had to make a choice. And, and they had 10 spies saying, oh, we can't never go in there. And they had Joshua and Caleb saying, come on, let's go. This will be a piece of cake. God's already given us the land, and the people in there are disheartened and fearful of us. We know they made the wrong choice. The question is, why? What was the driver there? Here's the blueprint. Why did they make the wrong choice? They were not strong. They were not courageous. They were terrified. And they allowed that terror to demoralize them and discourage them. And as I said, this is a new nation. This is a new day. This is a whole new group of people. And they are now given the opportunity to go in, 40 years have passed, all those unbelieving, rebellious people are gone now. And they have the chance to make a different choice, to go in a different direction. And if they are going to be successful, they have to trust God. I say it all the time, I hope it never becomes redundant it's one of the most powerful statements in the New Testament. I can do all things through Christ. He will give me the strength. There are way too many believers today that live out of an I can't response to everything. The, their, their instinctive response to challenges, I can't, I can't, I can't. And that is a direct denial of Scripture that says, no, you can. And it's not about you. It's about the Christ who lives in you. He will give you the strength. That is why I can do all things. 
when you live out of that kind of heart, an I can heart, there's no reason to be afraid. There's no reason to be discouraged. We have every reason to be strong and courageous because God is on our side. And if we are going to capitalize on the second chances that God gives us because he is gracious, we're going to have to seize those moments and live out of an I can heart as opposed to an I can't. Now, as soon as you start living out of an I can heart, this is what um, will define your path. You will now be focused on God's will. And if you kept your eyes or, or your Bibles open in uh, verse 7, I want to read it again. Be strong and very caref- uh, courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Notice how God reveals what Joshua must do. He doesn't say, Joshua, I want you to obey. He says, Joshua, I want you to be very careful to obey. And that word careful is a modifier that speaks to the idea of be intentional, concentrate, focus, be very deliberate, be very calculated as you approach life so that you're always doing the right thing, the thing that I want you to do. He reinforces that by saying, don't depart from the law. That's that's the blueprint. That's that's the, the, the engineer's drawing that you are to follow if you're going to be successful. So be very careful to follow the, the, the drawing. Don't ever depart from it. Now, now, now let's talk about reality for just a second. Because there, there are believers who for, for, for different reasons will deliberately disobey. Ideally, they're for very short seasons. They don't last long because it's hard to live in open rebellion against God. Those moments are real, but I would suggest for for most believers who are interested in, in walking with God and being the man or woman God wants them to be, most of the time those are very rare moments in our life. The reality for most believers who really want to be the man or woman God wants them to be is one of two things. And, and, and Joshua is, is told uh, to be wary of both of them. Often the problem is distraction. Life comes at us about 100 miles an hour. Joshua is told, be careful to obey. Be intentional, concentrate, focus, think about it, be deliberate to obey. But as life is coming out you a hundred miles an hour, it's really easy to just start reacting. And the idea of carefulness would say, instead of just reacting and, in, in, you know, and reacting impulsively or hastily, you know how our, how our politicians often say, well, well, we have to do something. No. You have to do the right thing. Something might be really good and it might be really bad. Maybe you ought to stop and think for just a moment and and don't just say, I have to do something. No, I have to do the right thing. And that might require a little bit of thought. So stop. Think. Ask this question. 
in light of these circumstances, in light of what's happening in my life right now, what would God like for an outcome in, 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 in this situation? And then what can I say, what can I do, what can I bring into this moment that God could use to bring about that outcome? That's what being careful to obey is talking about. It's not just reacting. It's asking, what does God want for an outcome? And then offering him tools with which he could work to bring about his desired outcome. That's what I mean, distraction. It's so easy to get, to get caught up in a reactionary life. And before you know it, we've departed from Scripture. Not because we intended to. Because we didn't stop and think and ask, what would God have? The other problem that is often true is the Scriptures were written thousands of years ago, right? We don't live thousands of years ago. We live in 2018. We live in a very modern world. Life is coming at us 100 miles an hour. And we may not know necessarily how to respond to this. I don't know what this is. I don't know what, what Scripture says about this. The Bible didn't talk about that. The other problem we could either say is, is a matter of awareness or more accurately, it's a lack of awareness. We don't know how the Scriptures address the circumstances we're facing. And it's really cool. I think God anticipated that. So what he says to Joshua is, Joshua, here's what you've got to do. You need to meditate on the Scriptures day and night. It's, it's kind of in the same vein as when David in the psalm said, Thy word have I treasured up in my heart so that I might not sin against thee. If, if, if I want to stay on the correct path and I don't want to depart and God's Word really is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, then it's time to turn the lights on. By meditating day and night, what is happening is Joshua is gaining insight from God's perspective on life. Now, let me just take a second and talk about what meditation is. Any of you know how to worry? Did you ever take a class in worrying? No, but we all know how to worry. Meditation and worry are just about the same thing. Meditation is, is the, the idea of mentally rehearsing, I'm mentally rehashing, I'm dwelling on, I'm, I'm chewing on. I'm thinking about a given issue. And we come to Scripture, and as we meditate on Scripture, what we're doing is we're closing some very important gaps that must be closed if we're going to live successfully, if we're going to live out a God-focused life. We're closing the gap between what the Scripture says, which is basically this, this is reading the verse. Well, what does that mean? And how does it fit into our world and our lives now in 2018? That's what meditation does. It allows us to close those gaps from, from this is what it says to this is how I do it today in my life and in my world. And when we get there, a God-focused life basically consists of doing whatever it is God is instructing you to do through the Word. Do not turn away. Here's the path. Go ye in it. And once again, if you look back to 40 years previously, Israel is on the border and God is inten God's intention is to lead them into the land. What did they do? They turned away. Why did they turn away? They were afraid. They were demoralized. 
they did that whole end of the world scenario. Woe is us. We're all going to die in the wilderness. We're all going to end up being slaves. They completely forgot God and turned away. That's why a God-centered life starts in our hearts. Be strong. Be courageous. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. Basically, God's saying, I got this. That moves to, okay, here's what God wants me to do. I need to be careful, make sure I'm doing that all the time. When you get there, what's going to happen is there will be a progressive transformation that takes place. When you look at the scriptures that, that God is sharing with Joshua, they really describe the heart of spiritual maturity. They describe the heart of of being more and more like God or more and more like Jesus. You see, the idea of doing and the idea of obeying. Here, here, here's the mistake many Christians make. Growing means knowing. Okay, I, I know so much about what the Bible has to say. And I know all about what God is and, and, and I know all about doctrine and church history and all this kind of stuff. I must be mature. How much did the Pharisees know? They knew an awful lot. You know what they didn't know? Who Jesus was when he stood right in front of them and said, Hey, guess what, folks? I'm the Messiah. I'm here to be your Savior. And they, they, they wanted to kill him. In fact, they did. They knew an awful lot. I don't think any of us would say, but they were really spiritually mature. Because there's a difference between knowing and obeying. There's also a difference. I, I mean, there, there's a certain element it, within Christianity that, that probably... I don't want to say they, they probably are members of a union because they think spiritual maturity is the equivalent of seniority. Well, I've been a Christian for 20 years. I've been a Christian 30 years, 40 years. Do you realize it's possible to be a spiritual infant even though you've been a Christian for 40 years, 50 years, 60 years? Because the measure of maturity is not seniority. It's not how much of the Bible that we're familiar with. The measure of maturity is in the practical everyday life. Do I look like Jesus? Do I sound like Jesus? Do I think like Jesus? Do I act like Jesus? Am I Jesus-like or not? If I am not Jesus-like then I am not mature. Now I know we're never going to do perfect. So, so when I say Jesus, like, oh, I've, I've, I've made a mistake. I, I, I've blown it. I'm, I'm, I'm no longer Jesus-like. I'm, I'm talking about the general course of our life. We should aspire and strive to be like Jesus. And the measure is, that, that obedience, that doing of whatever God has called us to do. And, and just in case you're not aware of this, let me emphasize this before we move on. The scope is comprehensive. What am I to obey? What am I to do? Everything. Unless, of course, you think God gave us irrelevant information that we, because we're smarter than God, can just dismiss. Anybody think that way? Oh, when, when God wrote that, he wasn't talking about me. <laughs> Anybody think that? God, God didn't understand. Things are different in 2018, so he didn't really mean that. He meant that for back then, but he doesn't mean that for today. Anybody think that? 
That's crazy thinking. God didn't give it irrelevant, worthless information, even when he was working with the disciples. And I think we looked at this a week or two ago. Matthew 28, 18 to 20, what we call the Great Commission, go into all the world, make disciples, baptize them, teach them to obey all that I've commanded you. And so a life of following Jesus should be a life where progressively we are getting better and better and better at obeying and doing what God has called us to do. And if we go back to where we started, okay, God has given me a second chance. What should I do with this second chance? Live a God-focused life. Well, what's that all about? That's, that's a heart that trusts. That's that's, that's a mind that is calculating and deliberate that stops and thinks about, about doing exactly what God has called me to do and the scope is everything. In, in every matter of my life, I want to make sure I'm applying Scripture to that moment. Well, what if I start living that way? Well, you're going to experience a God-centered reward. Let me read verses 7 and 8 once again. Be strong. Be very courageous. Be careful to obey all that my servant Moses gave you. Don't turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you might be careful to do everything written in it, then you will be prosperous and successful. Now, as soon as we start throwing words like prosperous and successful around, we have to be careful. How we define prosperous and successful in 2018 doesn't necessarily connect with what God is saying. And, and, and if you were not here today, if you were at home flipping channels in the religious section of your, of your um, TV, you'd see all kinds of people saying things like, God wants you to be rich. And God wants you to be healthy. And God wants you to be whatever. And, and if you will just send those cats some money, they will tell you the secret to success. The, the, the gospel of health, wealth, and prosperity. Think of all the people God would have to apologize to if those guys have it right. We need to be very careful that we don't put our understanding of things on to the scripture. So let me take that last phrase. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. It's the very last line up there on the screen. Let me give you a more literal understanding. Joshua, if you will do all of these things I just told you, then your way shall prosper, and then you shall act wisely. And I want to start with wisdom. Because I think wisdom precedes the concept of being successful or being prosperous. So let's start talking about wisdom. In Psalm 119, David records what is the longest psalm in all of the Bible. And it completely focuses on Scripture. This is how important Scripture is. This is how valuable Scripture is. This is all the stuff the Scripture will do for you. And it so mirrors exactly what God is saying to Joshua that I wanted to, I wanted to consider it this morning. Oh, how I love your law, David says. I meditate on it all day long. Now, isn't that what God just told Joshua? If you want to be successful, Joshua, here's what you got to do. You got to meditate. 
Well, now we're talking about what happens if I do meditate. What, what is this God-sized reward that I'm going to experience as I, as I live a God-focused life? Look at the rest that I have up there. Your commands. Okay, you're, I'm, I'm, I'm starting at verse 98 now. That, I'm confused. Nope, I got to go back there. Nope. There we go. I'm just going to start at the top so I don't confuse myself. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands are always with me. Here's what they do. They make me wiser than my enemies. That's a good thing, isn't it? If you're always one step ahead of your enemies, they're not going to catch you. It's, it's kind of like if you ever go hiking. And, and a bear comes. You don't have to outrun the bear. You know who you have to outrun? The slowest guy in the group. That's all you got to do. And if you can stay one step ahead of your enemies, he'll get somebody else that's trailing behind, but he won't get you because you're always going to be a step ahead of him. This is what wisdom does. It, it, it makes you wiser than your enemies. I have more insight than all my teachers, and every freshman already thinks that is true. And by the time you are a senior, you realize, I know so very little. I better keep pursuing education. I'm wiser than my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders. I've met a lot of churchgoers that thought that too. For I obey your precepts. I gain understanding from your precepts. Therefore, I hate every wrong path. The very things that God is, is, is hammering into Joshua was hammered into David. Because I meditate, because I spend time chewing on the Scriptures, rehashing the Scriptures, thinking about the Scriptures, closing the gap of this is what it says, and this is what God means, and this is how I can live it in my life. David is king. Joshua is the leader of God's people. You and I, in our circumstances in 2018, we're wiser than our enemies. We gain more insight than our teachers. We have understanding that exceeds those who have greater age and experience on their side, it is the means of gaining understanding and it is the means of being able to discern the right path from the wrong path and you begin to hate the wrong path. That's what wisdom does. Look at how Solomon describes it. Wisdom is a life where we trust in the Lord with all our heart and refuse to lean on our own understanding. Go back 40 years earlier. On what was Israel leaning when they said, we can't go in? Their own understanding. They weren't leaning on God. Even though they had Caleb and Joshua saying, let's go, it's a piece of cake. They were leaning on their own understanding. In all your ways... Submit to him. Literally, that word submit is know him. What is his will? What is his desired outcome in this instance? In all your ways, know him, and he will make your path straight. Some versions would read smooth. He'll smooth the way. He'll straighten the way. That's what wisdom does. So so as, as, as Joshua is about to lead the people, and God says, okay, If you will live a God-focused life, Joshua, you're going to grow in wisdom and because you are now walking in wisdom, what happens is you start experiencing success. Doesn't mean necessarily that you're going to be the CEO of a Fortune 500 company and pull down millions, if not billions of dollars. Doesn't mean you're going to be the next movie star. Doesn't mean you're going to be the next superstar in football or basketball. What it does mean is 
whatever God designed you to do, whatever God designed you to be, whatever purpose he has for you, as you walk with him and focus on him and lean not on your own understanding, you're going to discover who he made you to be, what he made you to do, and you're going to do it well. And you're going to be successful in doing it. And, and, and David describe, uh, describes it in Psalm 1 in a really cool way. Blessed is one who doesn't walk in step with the wicked. He doesn't stand in the way that sinners take. He doesn't sit in the company of mockers. Instead, he finds his delight in the law of the Lord, and he meditates on God's law day and night. Well, what's that person like? That person's like a tree. None of us are trees. But if we were, this is the kind of tree I would like to be. I'd like to be a tree planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither, and whatever they do, notice the personification, we're going from trees to people now, whatever they do prospers. Wouldn't you like to have the kind of life that whatever you do prospers? Well, that's what God is offering Joshua. Joshua, Moses had just handed you the baton. You're about to enter the promised land, something Moses tried to do 40 years earlier, and as great a leader as Moses was, failed. Don't make the same mistakes. Don't let your people make the same mistakes. Because if you make the same mistakes, you get the same results. But if you will live a God-focused life, you will be wise, and with wisdom comes success. One of my favorite passages from Jesus himself. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, and puts them in the practice, which is exactly what God is telling Joshua. Be careful to obey. Do not turn from the law. Put them in the practice. Well, that guy's like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain came down, and the streams rose, and the winds blew, and they beat against the house. Yet it did not fall because it had a foundation on the rock. Notice, wisdom doesn't preclude you from experiencing the storms of life. But what wisdom will do, it will let you stand up against the storms of life. Whereas, if you take a different path, Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them in the practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the stand and when the storm came, it fell with a great crash. Wisdom is inseparably united in Scripture to success. As Joshua is leading Israel into the promised land, he wants to be successful. As we wake up in the morning and engage a new day, realize you're living in a broken world. If you want to navigate the brokenness of this world and come out successfully, you better live a God-focused life so that God blesses you with the wisdom you need to navigate all the brokenness of this world. Let me try to wrap this up for this morning. It is very easy for us to look behind ourselves, see failure, see mistakes, see disappointment, see hurt and pain. And it's so very easy to let that begin to define you and let that begin to dictate your future. Oh, this is all I'm ever going to be. I'm a failure. And when we do that, we are overlooking God's grace. I don't know if you noticed, but several times, one in verse 5 and then once again in verse 9, God emphasizes, Joshua, as I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Then in verse 9, I will be with you wherever you go. That's what he says to us. 
I'll never give up on you. And if God is never going to give up on us, should we ever give up on ourselves? The answer is no. Because God is gracious. And God will give out second chances, third chances, fourth chances. God will keep on giving out chances because He will not give up on us. But like we started, that means... If I'm going to seize that second, third, or fourth chance, I've got to do things differently. And what Joshua is told to do is to live a God-focused life because when you do, the success and the prosperity of that life, the fruitfulness of that life begins to show up. I love this verse. It's where I get that phrase, do the next right thing. Don't ever get tired of doing the next right thing. You know why? Because at the proper time, you'll reap a harvest if you do not give up. The grace of God says, if I don't like what's going on in my life today, get the plow, get the rototiller, get the shovel, dig it up. Dig it up. Plant new seeds. Living a God-focused life and then it's just a matter of time for that new harvest to grow up. And if you don't give up, you will reap a good harvest in due season. Take advantage of God's grace. You may be here this morning. One of the things I believe about God is He's everywhere all the time. And He's talking to us and working on us all the time. And I have no clue how that might apply to you. But I know it's quite possible someone is here and, and maybe for the last week or maybe for the last several weeks, God has been working on you and God has been talking to you and God has been trying to call you to be a believer. And maybe He brought you here today for that very reason. Maybe He brought you here today, you're already Christian and, and, and you kind of... Either we're distracted or, or unaware, but you've begun to drift, and it's like, whoa, this is a wake-up call for me. But I believe God is everywhere all the time, and He's constantly working on us, and He's constantly trying to live in relationship with us where we are saying every single day, not my will, thy will be done and live that God-centered life. So, so if you're ready to take that step, I'm going to assume as a believer you know how to do that. If you're here and, and, and you're kind of ready to, to, to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, He's been working on you, and, and, and you've come to that unavoidable conclusion, man, I need God. I surrender. I'm ready to give up. Then, then I invite you to pray with me as we close. Father, oh, I've lived my entire life apart from you. And I believe you brought me here today because I needed to hear this. You have given me multiple chances, none of which have I ever capitalized on. And I now understand why. I did not take the second chance and begin to focus on you and allow you to live in me and through me. And I realize that today. And Father, today I ask that you would forgive me. And I invite you into my life. I want you to be my Savior. I want you to be my Lord. I want you to have control. So that you can lead me. And I will do my best not to turn to the right hand or to the left. I will do my best to be careful to obey. Because what I now realize is if I am going to be successful, I need you. I cannot be successful without you. So please come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. I invite you to be my Savior, and I want you to be my leader. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.